This is chapter number seven, The Necklace. Matilda is invited to a grand party. She has a beautiful dress but no jewellery. She borrows a necklace from a friend and loses it. What happens then? Read and find out. What kind of a person is Madame Lossel? Why is she always unhappy? What kind of a person is her husband? She was one of those pretty young ladies born as if through an error of destiny into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no hopes, no means of becoming known, loved and married by a man either rich or distinguished, and she allowed herself to marry a petty clerk in the office of the Board of Education. She was simple, but she was unhappy. She, she suffered incessantly, feeling herself born for all delicacies and luxuries. She suffered from the poverty of her apartment, the shabby walls and the worn chairs. All these things tortured and angered her. When she seated herself for dinner opposite her husband, who uncovered the tureen with a delighted air, saying, Oh, the good pot pie! I know nothing better than that. She would think of elegant dinners of shining silver. She thought of the exquisite food served in marvellous dishes. She had neither frocks nor jewels, nothing, and she loved only those things. She had a rich friend, a schoolmate at the convent, who she did not like to visit. She suffered so much when she returned. She wept for whole days from despair and disappointment. One evening, her husband returned elated, bearing in his hand a large envelope. Here, he said, here is something for you. She quickly drew out a printed card on which were inscribed these words, the Minister of Public Instruction and Madame George Rampunu asked the honour of Monsieur and Madame Lassell's company. Monday evening, January 18th, at the minister's residence. Instead of being delighted as her husband had hoped, she threw the invitation spitfully upon the table, murmuring, What do you suppose I want with that? But, Mary, I thought it would make you happy. You never go out, and this is an occasion, and a fine one. Everybody wishes one, and it is very select. Not many are given to employees. You will see the whole official world there. She looked at him with an irritated eye and declared impatiently, What do you suppose I have to wear to such a thing as that? He had not thought of that, he stammered. Why, the dress you wear when we go to the theatre, it seems very pretty to me. He was silent, stupefied, in dismay at the sight of his wife weeping. He stammered, What is the matter? What is the matter? By a violent effort, she had controlled her vexation and responded in a calm voice, wiping her moist cheeks. Nothing. Only I have no dress and consequently I cannot go to this affair. Give your card to some colleague whose wife is better fitted out than I. He was grieved but answered, Let us see, Matilda, how much would a suitable costume cost? Something that would serve for other occasions? Something very simple? She reflected for some seconds, thinking of a sum that she could ask for without bringing with it an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally, she said, in a hesitating voice, I cannot tell exactly, but it seems to me that 400 francs ought to cover it. He turned a little pale, for he had saved just this sum to buy a gun, that he might be able to join some hunting parties the next summer, with some friends who went to shoot larks on Sunday. Nevertheless, he answered, very well, I will give you 400 francs, but try to have a pretty dress. Read and out. What fresh problem now disturbs Madame Loisel? How is the problem solved? The day of the ball approached, and Madame Loisel seemed sad, disturbed, anxious. Nevertheless, her dress was nearly ready. Her husband said to her one evening, What is the matter with you? You have acted strangely for two or three days. As she responded, I am vexed not to have a jewel, nothing to adorn, to adorn myself with. I shall have such a poverty-stricken look. I would prefer not to go to this party. He replied, You can wear some natural flowers in the season. They look very chic. She was convinced. No, she replied. There is nothing more humiliating than to have a shabby air in the midst of rich women. Then her husband cried out, How stupid, How stupid we are. Go and find your friend. Madame Forestier, and ask her to lend you her jewels. She uttered a cry of joy. It is true, she said. 
I had not thought of that. The next day, she took herself to her friend's house and related a story of distress. Madame Forestier went to her closet, took out a large well case, brought it, opened it and said, Choose, my dear. She saw at first some bracelets, then a collar of pearls, then a Venetian cross of gold and jewels of admirable workmanship. She tried the jewels before the glass, hesitated, but could neither decide to take them nor leave them. Then she asked, Have you nothing more? Why, yes, look for yourself. I do not know what will please you. Suddenly she discovered a black satin box, a superb necklace of diamonds. Her hands trembled as she took it out. She placed it about her throat, against her dress and was ecstatic. Then she asked in a hesitating voice full of anxiety, Could you lend me this? Only this. Why, yes, certainly. She fell upon the neck of her friend, embraced her with passion, then went away with her treasure. The day of ball arrived. Madame Loisel was a great success. She was the prettiest of all, elegant, gracious, smiling and full of joy. All the men noticed her, asked her name and wanted to be presented. She danced with enthusiasm, intoxicated with pleasure, thinking of nothing but all this admiration. This victory so complete and sweet of her heart. She went home towards four o'clock in the morning. Her husband had been half asleep in one of the little salons since midnight, with three other gentlemen whose wives were enjoying themselves very much. He threw around her shoulders the modest wraps they had carried, whose poverty clashed with the elegance of the ball costume. She wished to hurry away in order not to be noticed by the other women who were wrapping themselves in rich furs. Loisel detained her. Wait, said he, I am going to call a cab. But she would not listen and descended the steps rapidly. When they were in the street, they found no carriage, and they began to seek for one, hailing the coachman, whom they saw at a distance. They walked along towards the river, hopeless and shivering. Finally, they found one of those old carriages that one sees in Paris after nightfall. It took them as far as their door, and they went wearily up to their apartment. It was all over for her. And on his part, he remembered that he would have to be at the office by 10 o'clock. She removed the wraps from her shoulders before the glass for a final view of herself in her glory. Suddenly, she uttered a cry. Her necklace was not around her neck. Read and find out. What do Monsieur and Madame Loisel do next? How do they replace the necklace? Loisel, already half undressed, asked, What is the matter? She turned towards him excitedly. I have, I have, I no longer have Madame Forestier's necklace. He arose in dismay. What? How is that? It is not possible. And they looked in the folds of the dress, in the folds of the cloak, in the pockets, everywhere they could not find it. He asked, You are sure you still had it when we left the minister's house? Yes, I felt it as we came out. But if you had lost it in the street, we would have heard it fall. It must be in the cab. Yes, it is possible. Did you take the number? No. And you? Did you notice what it was? No. They looked at each other utterly cast down. Finally, Loisel dressed himself again. I am going, he said, over the track where we went on foot to see if I can find it. And he went. She remained in her evening gown, not having the force to go to bed. Towards seven o'clock, her husband returned. He had found nothing. He went to the police and to the cab offices and to put an advertisement in the newspapers offering a reward. She waited all day in a state of bewilderment before this frightful disaster. Loisel returned in the evening. His face pale. He had discovered nothing. He said, Write to your friend that you have broken the clasp of the necklace and that you will have it repaired. That will give us time. She wrote as he dictated. At the end of a week, they had lost all hope. And Loisel, and Loisel, older by five years, declared, We must replace this jewel. In a shop of Palais Royal, they found a chaplet of diamonds, which seemed to them exactly like the one they had lost. It was valued for 40,000 francs. They could get it for 36,000. Loisel possessed 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He borrowed the rest. He made Ruinous promises took money from took money from assurers and the whole race of lenders. Then he went to get the new necklace, depositing on the merchant's counter thirty six thousand francs. 
When Madame, when Madame Loisel took back the jewels from Madame Forestier, the latter said to her in a frigid tone, "You should have returned them to me sooner, for I might have needed them." Madame Forestier did not open the jewel box, as Madame Loisel feared she would. What would she think if she should perceive the substitution? What should she say? Would she take her for a robber? Madame Loisel now knew the horrible life of necessity. She did her part, however, completely heroically. It was necessary to pay this frightful debt. She would pay it. They sent away the maid. They changed their lodgings. They rented some room in an attic. She learned the odious work of a kitchen. She washed the dishes. She washed the soiled linen, their clothes and dish clothes, which she hung on the line to dry. She took down the refuse to the street each morning and brought up the water, stopping at each landing to catch her breath. And clothed like a woman of the people, she went to the grocers, the butchers, and the fruiterers with her basket on her arm, shopping. Haggling to the last sou of her miserable money, the husband worked evenings putting the books of some merchants in order, and nights he often did copying at five sous a page, and this life lasted for ten years. At the end of ten years, they had restored all. Madame Loisel seemed old now. She had become a strong, hard woman, the crude woman of the poor household. Her hair badly dressed, her skirts awry. Her hands red. She spoke in a loud tone and washed the floors with large pails of water. But sometimes, when her husband was at office, she would seat herself before the window and think of that evening party of former times, of that ball where she was so beautiful and so flattered. How would it have been if she had not lost the necklace? Who knows? How singular is life, and how full of changes! How small a thing would ruin or save one! One Sunday, as she was taking a walk in the Champs Elysees to rid herself of the cares of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman walking with a child. It was Madame Forestier, still young, still pretty, still attractive. Madame Loisel was affected. Should she speak to her? Yes, certainly. And now that she had paid, she would tell her all. Why not? She approached her. Good morning, Jane. Her friend did not recognize her. And was astonished to be so familiarly addressed by this common personage. She stammered, "But, Madame, I do not know. You must be mistaken." "I am Matilda Loisel." Her friend uttered a cry of astonishment. "Oh, my poor Matilda, how you have changed!" "Yes, I have had some hard days since I saw you, and some miserable ones, and all because of you." "Because of me? How is that?" You recall the diamond necklace that you loaned me to wear to ministers' ball? Yes, very well. We well, I lost it. How is that? Since you returned it to me, I returned another to you exactly like it, and it had taken us ten years to pay for it. You can understand that it was not easy for us who have nothing, but it is finished, and I am decently content. Madame Forestier stopped short. She said. You say that you bought a diamond necklace to replace mine. Yes, you did not perceive it then. They were just alike, and she smiled with proud and simple joy. Madame Forestier was touched and took both her hands as she replied, "Oh, my poor Matilda, mine was false. They were not worth over five hundred francs." Thank you. Thank you. If you like this audio, do subscribe to my channel, like the video. and share it with your friends thank you once again